Thank you, um, everybody, for joining us today. Um, it's a different version of AgriFocus, but um, we're, we're getting the information to you anyway. Um, so we're, we're talking about this year's um, iteration of the wheat um, variety management work um, we've been doing for a couple of years now. Um, so if you've been at an SFS event before, um, this, these set of trials usually feature um, or are a main feature. Um, so we're going to start with a quick summary um, of the results from 2019 uh, and then we're going to go into the type of trials we're doing um, this year uh, and after that we'll sort of go into a bit more detail on the factors um, that, we're, uh, that we're looking at and um, what you can expect to see from us after harvest. Uh, so here's a summary um, of the main um, points from 2019. Uh, and they have been written up in detail in uh, the results book. Uh, the biggest finding we had um, last year was the fact that we saw an increase in yield um, from a PGR application, um, despite the fact that we didn't have any lodging. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, afterwards. Uh, the next finding was, um, was around nitrogen. Uh, so the nitrogen rates we applied um, with the yield target of um, 7 tonne per hectare, for example, um, the actual yield um, exceeded that target quite significantly. Uh, and the nitrogen we applied for a higher uh, yield target, uh, 9 tonnes, um, the nitrogen was excessive um, for the crop's requirements and it went into grain protein. So what we saw was really no differences um, in yield uh, between the two nitrogen rates we used. We had some really good yields, um, which uh, maxed out just um, just under 11 tonnes at Inverlee. Um, but don't forget that they're plot yields, they're not um, paddock yields that take into account, um, you know, wheel tracks and headlands and that kind of thing. Uh, and that variety was um, actually ACROC, but followed fairly closely by Annapurna. Uh, we had pretty low levels of disease last year. Um, we had some uh, fungicide and disease treatments that we were trying to um, have a look at but we didn't see a whole lot of benefit from um, a higher than standard fungicide program last year anyway. I don't think it would be the same this year. <laughs> um, so a very quick summary of um, last year. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Ash um, who's going to talk about this year's trials. Thanks Gina. Um, so yeah, our variety biomanagement trials have evolved again in 2020. We've been doing these for a few years now and um, every year they sort of seem to evolve a little bit further. Uh, so this year we've returned to having multiple varieties per trial. So last year we went to only having one um, and then having that comparison, but we've sort of combined them again, which allows us to have that variety comparison again too, which is great. Um, but we've also kept the ability to directly compare where differences are coming from. Um, within management so we can analyze the factors at different levels we can consider the interactions and also how those factors are acting independently too um, yeah which is which is great I think we've sort of found probably the sweet spot this year for um, the the way that we've set them up and it'll be great to have them analyzed at the end of the year and see how we can pull them apart so this year we've got three management factors per trial again um, and the wheat trials are located at three sites. So at Imbali we've got five spring varieties so we've got BSF Ascot, Catapult, Trojan, Rockstar and Sheriff and we're looking at two other factors with that so PGR with and without a PGR application at GS31 and we're also looking at a nitrogen as a yield target so we adjust the total amount of N supplied to the crop to target a particular crop yield. So in the spring varieties, we're targeting yields of 10 and 8 tonne per hectare. Uh, at Inverlee, we also have four winter varieties. So we are looking at, which I think is coming up. Yep, so Annapurna, Acrop, Calibro, and Manning. Um, so we also have 
the same factors again with and without PTR and then the nitrogen targets there too. So 11 and 8 ton per hectare. So there's just that slight difference um, in the yield target with those winters. We've sort of gone up another ton for the top target there. Uh, the next trial site is our Stretham branch trial site at Wallora. So we're looking at four slow spring wheat varieties, Annapurna, Beaufort, Bennett and Akrock. And again, the same management factors here. So we've got PGR with and without, and then the nitrogen yield targets there are seven and 10 ton per hectare. And the final site of the three is our skiing trial site, um, uh, which is our Hamilton branch site. We've got four winter wheat varieties here again, uh, Annapurna, Manning, Calabro, and SFR, SFR 86090. Same management factors here again, with and without PGR, and our nitrogen yield targets of 11 and 9 ton per hectare uh, out at this site. So that's sort of a bit of an overview, I suppose, of, um, of the trials themselves, and we're just going to go into a bit more detail now into those three management factors, uh, and we're going to start with nitrogen. So um, there's a lot of factors that contribute to your potential for a given season, with nitrogen being a big one, but it is also just one. So I suppose supplying your crop with nitrogen can mean more yield, but it's just important to, to sort of remember everything else in the system still needs to be right as well to achieve those top yields. So just something to consider, I guess, as we go along um, while we're talking about nitrogen and those yield targets, that it's sort of, it's not only about that, but it's sort of about getting everything else in the system happening and right as well to sort of be maximising those yields. So as we just looked at before, each of our trials have two nitrogen yield targets. Um, these trials specifically are about understanding different management strategies and determining the yield and economics at the end of the season. So was it economically viable in a season such as 2020 to apply higher rates of nitrogen? Uh, the two yield targets are able to help us determine this and sort of help us tell that story. So setting our yield targets. Um, each of our yield targets are determined based on a site's yield potential. Uh, so soil type, rainfall, paddock history, etc. They're adjusted in season to reflect the conditions as the season progresses uh, and also the seasonal outlook. So for example, this year with our favourable winter conditions uh, where we saw sort of lower than average rainfall um, and then we had a promising spring outlook, we made a decision to increase our yield targets. So at most sites we added another ton per hectare um, through additional urea. We also consider varietal maturity, um, so spring versus winter types with higher nitrogen, uh, as I said before, going on to our winter wheat trial at Imbali compared with the spring trial at the same site. And lastly, a big consideration for our nitrogen applications and yield targets is our starting soil nitrogen. So a deep end soil test provides the basis for determining our requirements um, and is the starting point of our nitrogen calculations for the season. So here um, we're just going to have a look at an example, uh, some of our calculations. This is at our Laura site. So on the graph outlines kilograms of nitrogen on the left axis uh, and yield as ton per hectare on the right axis. So we're using the general rule of thumb that 40 kilos of N per hectare equates to one ton per hectare of yield, assuming 60% efficiency of fertilizer N. So starting from the bottom, um, we've got the two green boxes on the graph. We have initial soil nitrogen in the zero to 60 zone. So we took, this equates to about 130 kilos of N. We've also included some estimated mineralized, which you can see there in yellow, and Gina is kindly highlighting for me. Um, so in total, that adds up to about 190 kilos of N as starting soil. So everything below that dashed line um, will be the soil nitrogen and some mineralized. Um, so when you look across that dashed line, you can see on the right axis, it's sort of sitting equivalent to about 4.7 tonne um, per hectare of yield based on what we, I sort of mentioned of that 40 kilos equating to one tonne. So in season, urea, applica urea applications were then applied to top up those to those yield targets. So at late tillering, sort of mid-July was the first application, which has just gone up there in orange. The second application went on at stem extension around mid-August 
And then a final application was applied to the higher yield target um, of 10 at flag leaf emergence, so sort of early September. Um, this was applied following the decision to increase those targets based on the favourable conditions we had. Um, so that's sort of see, you can see there where, where they sit. So our seven and our 10 tonne per hectare. Um, and if you move across to, the, to that right sort of axis, you can see where they sit there. In terms of costs for the additional nitrogen, um, so it was an increased cost of $150 a hectare to target that 10 tonne um, compared with the seven tonne. Um, so I suppose in relation to costs, it's also important to consider the other interactions here as well. Um, so how do variety, PGR or fungicide strategy impact on yield at that higher yield target? So typically higher nitrogen, maybe increased biomass, potentially more PGR requirements, um, which is increased costs again. So I guess if I didn't get my lodging under control, was it worth the additional nitrogen? Uh, so these are some of the factors we will consider in an economic analysis at the end of the season. And yeah, it's um, quite interesting always to sort of break those down and have a look. So that's sort of a bit of a wrap on nitrogen. Um, and I'm now gonna hand back to Gina, who's gonna go into a bit more detail on the PGRs. Uh, thank you, Ash. Uh, so just to have um, a bit more in-depth look at the 2019 results um, in regards to PGRs. Um, now we did think this time last year that we wouldn't be looking at PGRs in wheat again, um, but the yield results we got last year um, did change our minds and I'm going to show you why that is. Uh, the four varieties on the left hand side are the ones that we um, used a PGR on uh, and they were all grown at Inverlee. Um, we didn't have the conditions um, or the opportunity to use a PGR at the other sites um, last year, unfortunately. Um, now, I do need to point out that the, the varieties were in separate trials, um, so the yield data across the varieties um, cannot be compared, um, only the PGR treatment within a variety. Um, for example, uh, with ACROC, you can say that the yield um, with the PGR was greater than no PGR, uh, but it cannot be said that um, the ACROC yielded better than another variety, statistically speaking. Um, that's something we've addressed this year, as Ash was saying before, um, with the new trial design, um, where we have multiple varieties um, in each trial. Um, what we can conclude is um, that the addition of a PGR has increased um, the yield significantly um, in all cases. Uh, we're not entirely sure why we've um, seen such an increase in in yield um, when we didn't have any lodging present in the trials. Um, we want to look at this a bit further next year and in future years. Um, but one of the ideas we've had is around um, ERICS. Um, it's that PGR that makes the crop, um, top of the crop really nice and level. So the heads are sort of all in the same, same space. Um, and you don't get those different heights in the canopy um, at the end of the season. Uh, so one thought is um, that it takes away the dominance um, of the main stem. Um, and because of that, the other tillers um, are able to produce more yield. Um, the other theory um, is related to root development. Um, so by regulating um, the growth of the foliage um, above ground, there's a thought that, um, that the plant might be able to reassign that um, growth into root development. Um, so there's a couple of theories floating around there. I'm really interested to hear what you guys think um, at the end of the session. Um, or outside of this, whatever. Um, the next question, I suppose, um, is it worth it? Uh, so these are the gross margins we put together for 2019. Um, you can see that we had some pretty good margins, even the um, lowest of them is probably higher than we normally expect, but, and that is just down to the good um, year we had and the good season, um, and we got some pretty good yields. Um, uh, the additional cost um, of the PGR we used is about 40 bucks a hectare, um, including operations. Um, so you can see the return was a good bit above the cost of the application, which made us pretty happy. <coughs> um, unfortunately, there is an error in the results book um, with these calculations for this specific graph. Um, we're going to try and um, fix that up on the electronic version. 
Um, but if you have read that article recently um, and you're scratching your head over what I'm saying here, that's because we've got corrected information here. So apologies for that. Uh, so this year, again, um, we've included a PGR treatment at, um, in the wheat trails based on the results we got last year. Um, so we've got MODIS at 100 mil um, and ERIX at 1.3 litres, which is the maximum rate of ERIX. And that's been applied across all varieties at all sites. Uh, what we're seeing so far is some visual differences in height uh, and structure of the crop, um, but also that levelness I was talking about before. Um, but we do have um, a, good, a bit of the season left, particularly for the winter varieties with growth. Um, so we're, we're still doing assessments on those and we're going to get that information to you later in the year. We are seeing the beginnings of um, some lodging um, uh, in these trials. So I guess on the upside to that, um, the exciting thing is um, we'll be able to present to you guys um, at the end of the season um, the interaction of a PGR treatment um, with different nitrogen management strategies. Um, so potentially we'll see um, increased lodging in the higher nitrogen strategies and less in the lower strategies and that's going to help us tease out the, um, the PGR treatment as well. <coughs> and just something to think about for question time um, after the session. Uh, we really want to know what information you guys um, want to see from these trials. Um, they're technically they're, they're your trials. Um, so we've got an opportunity this year with that lodging and the interaction between nitrogen and um, PGR. So um, yeah, hopefully you can let us know what you want to see, what sort of information you need, because um, this PGR question has been, been around for a while now. So um, <coughs> hopefully you can let us know. But for now, I'm going to hand back to Ash um, and she's going to talk about the varieties we've got in the trials this year. Helps if I unmute myself. Um, thanks, Gina. Uh, so I went through the list of varieties at the start as well, um, but I just wanted to put them up again and, and sort of take the time to thank those companies who've been involved in these trials as well. Uh, so we've got varieties um, entered from Seedforce, AGT, Grain Search, AGF Seeds and BSF. Um, so yeah, it, a big thank you to those guys um, for being involved. We appreciate it and we wouldn't be able to host these trials um, without you guys. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, so just looking at them again, we clearly have quite a range of varieties included uh, with some new releases in Annapurna, BSF Ascot, um, varying growth habits, disease risks and packages and grain qualities there as well. So more information on each of these varieties will be added to the e-booklet. Um, so that will be for your reference. It has all the disease resistance ratings and, and the grain qualities and that sort of thing as well. So this photo here I also thought shows quite a good comparison of three varieties. So this is at our Blora trial site. Uh, we've got Akrok, Annapurna and Beaufort. So it was taken mid-July um, and you can see quite a clear distinction in Beaufort here. Um, so Akrok and Annapurna are at late tillering and Beaufort has just started going to stem extension. Um, so close to, to GS30 there. So yeah, quite a visual sort of photo. So you can be, can't be out in the paddocks where um, we're trying to sort of show you guys what we're seeing, which is good. Um, there's also been some quite visual differences in canopy structure between varieties. So here on the left, we've got our SFR 86090, which is from Seedforce. Um, it's an, effectively an ornless version of Acroc um, due to be commercially released in 2020. And then to this other side, to the right hand side, we've got Clubro. Um, and visually, you can see quite different canopy structures there. So, Clubro has a far more erect leaf than a 090. Um, and then within trials, we've also seen differences in maturity. So, we have grouped these by maturity, um, but yeah, there still are some slight differences here. So, we've got Annapurna and Manning. Uh, these are both at our scheme trial site, sewn so on the same date. So this photo was taken about a week ago. Um, you can see Annapurna's at head emergence. Um, so GS57, year three quarters emerged, whereas Manning's um, slightly slower. So is the, the tips of ears just starting to come through. 
Um, so sowing dates are targeted to try and optimise that flowering timing when the frost and heat stress are both at a minimum. Um, so that optimal timing's been found to be around that third week of October um, for our region. We've seen many of our spring varieties already flowering at Inverlee in that first to sort of second week of October. So perhaps a little earlier than anticipated. Um, and so I'm just going to have a look, yeah, at, at um, Annapurna here. We've got an example of just the growth and development. The reason I picked Annapurna was mainly just because it is across all three sites. Um, so it's the only variety that we have in all three sites. Um, and so along the X axis at the bottom, you can see the number of days from sowing. And just to sort of note that it is starting at 100 days um, and the sites are on the Y axis. So the light green is displaying the time taken to reach GS30, so growth stage 30, uh, start of stem extension. So the bigger the block there, the longer it's taken to reach that key growth stage, basically. So you can clearly see it's taken much longer for Annapurna to reach stem extension at Inverlee compared with the other two sites at Skeen and Wallora. And although it hasn't caught up completely, you can see in the orange, um, which is the time taken to move from 32 to 39 uh, of flag leaf emergence, it's much quicker at Inverlee compared to the other two sites. After finding this development in Annapurna, we decided to have a look at another variety was at, that was at two of the sites as well to determine if it was linked to the variety or the site. So interestingly, when tracking the development of Manning as well, uh, we found the same results. So the number of days from sowing to reach GS30 was much longer at Inverlee again compared with Skeen. So indicating it was something occurring at the Inverlee site, not necessarily just in one variety. One theory we investigated was the temperature difference uh, between the two sites that may have impacted the vernalisation period. Uh, so a vernalisation period is when the plants need to undergo a period of cold temperature to move from vegetative to reproductive. And as you can see on the graph displayed at each month except September, uh, average temperatures at Inverlee were warmer than Skeen. In some cases, such as in May, um, even one and a half degrees warmer on average. So potentially these higher temperatures or higher than on average temperatures at Inverlee could have contributed to the increased time in reaching GS30 compared with Skeen. So I guess if anyone has any, any other thoughts or comments on this um, and the ventilization period required by these varieties, uh, please feel free to, to share in the chat box uh, or join in the conversation following the presentation. Um, yeah, we'd certainly be interested to hear your thoughts as well. So um, in summary, and we're going to finish up there, but um, we've got four trials this year um, across our branches, um, two nitrogen management strategies based on two yield targets for each trial, um, a PGR and, and a PGR in a plus or minus fashion. Um, there's uh, 12 varieties total and they're in trials but together based on maturity uh, within each grouping or trial of varieties, um, we'll be able to isolate um, or combine the effects um, of each of those three factors, so variety, nitrogen strategy, and PGR. Um, so watch this space for express results during harvest um, and the full results early next year. We're happy to take any questions now, Michelle. Thank you. Well, we do have one question in the chat box. So what was the fungicide program for the PGR weeks? So we applied to PGR. Uh, for this year, um, the, the fungicide plan that we've done is quite, um, quite a higher level fungicide. So we haven't um, done that as a treatment. Um, so what we've done is we've just tried to exclude um, the effect of any disease in these trials. Um, so we had, um, done a three fungicide strategy this year so that's um, opus at 32 um, aviator at 39 and we've just gone out with a head wash of um, radial so pretty high level fungicide strategy there but we are just trying to remove that as a factor from these trials and disease has definitely uh, come into the picture of the last couple of weeks um, is what you've okay. been seeing yeah, particularly in Inverlee, we're seeing um, a lot of disease, um, more so in barley than wheat, but in wheat certainly as well. Um, so yeah, we're, that's why we've gone with that um, heavier strategy. 
Any more questions from the audience? Uh, did you see disease in these management trials as such or are they in the other trials? Um, specifically, um, I've, my judgment I've based on um, untreated trials um, that we have around the site. So that's sort of just a, an assessment of the pressure that we're seeing. Um, so um, no disease, uh, not much disease in the, um, the trials that we're talking about here. So uh, mostly in untreated trials, yeah. As Ashley made mention about the nitrogen strategies, um, it's all good to think, yeah, it's a good season, put more nitrogen out, but you really do need to take in these factors. And that's why these, I suppose we do these management trials and we're pulling apart the factors that, yes, we can put the nitrogen out, but are we going to be taken out by lodging or um, disease? So any more comments around that? Um, I think that's what these, like the way we've set these up now, it, it's such a good way to be able to pull apart and sort of see where those differences are coming from. Um, in the past, before last year, we probably wouldn't have even considered that some of those differences had come from PGRs because there was that absence of lodging. Um, so we probably would have made more of an assumption that maybe it was the nitrogen or, or the disease package necessarily that, um, that was making those differences. So I think that's what has been really interesting in the last couple of years is, is being able to see where those differences are. Um, and yeah, as, as you said, and, and as I sort of mentioned, it's, it's about getting the whole system right, I suppose. Um, so if you really try to maximise your yields, you, you need to be understanding what's going on uh, with every sort of factor and trying to optimise that um, to, to sort of optimise your, your yield potential, I suppose. Any more questions before we wrap up? Yep. Have you seen any BYDB this year given the green bridge earlier? And do you think the seed treatment is sufficient in a season like this one? I think John's seen some of our trials. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we have seen a touch of what we think is BYDB, um, but uh, we use Gaucho on, on all our um, seed um, for trials anyway. Uh, and despite that, we have seen a, a little bit here and there of what we think is BYDV. Um, so, yeah, perhaps um, in a high pressure year like this, it hasn't quite been enough. Um, but, yeah, I haven't seen anything untreated, so I can't comment um, specifically on that. Thank you, Gina. I think any more questions? I think we've explained it very well and um, we look forward to seeing the results in the, um, in the booklet.